So yeah, so today we're just going to talk at a real high level about special topics, which are you know sort of the forefront of um, the things we do. Although there are a few things like horizontal wells, uh, which are in these slides that you actually did, uh, at least in CMG, uh, you, you looked, you did some horizontal well stuff. So uh, I think this was maybe on the very first day of class. Even we talked about res different reservoir simulators. There are you know, the, your commercial simulators, CMG and Eclipse. I would guess that CMG and Eclipse together probably have like 80 or 90 percent of the market share in terms of commercial simulators. Um, I, I think at any super major company, you'd have multiple licenses of either or maybe possibly both of those simulators. Um, and then, of course, there's other ones, Intersect, which is this collaboration between Knowledge Schlumberger and Chevron, and Nexus from Halliburton. Um, but uh, CMG and Eclipse are by far um, the most ubiquitous. There, there are also several in-house reservoir simulators. So these are from, you know, these, when, I, when we say in-house, we mean, you know, they don't share these. They don't sell these, right? These are codes that were written internally uh, at these companies. And... You know, if you work for one of those companies, you have an opportunity to use those. Um, but but if you don't, it's unlikely, right? And then academic, right? So uh, UT Chem, which uh, uh, is developed here in this department. Um, in fact, uh, let's see, all of these except for uh, Tough 2, which is developed at Lawrence Berkeley, uh, all three of these are basically from the University of Texas, IPARS. Is uh, Mary Wheeler, uh, uh, GPOS, UT Comp. This is uh, Dr. Kami Sefanori's. So this is a comp compositional flow simulator. Uh, UT Chem is probably the most ubiquitous code in the world uh, for use for chemical EOR. Uh, and uh, in fact, what happens is, I mean, these these are research codes that are essentially developed by faculty members and graduate students in the course of doing theses and PhD dissertations. So Everything that's, uh, these are sort of the platforms used for cutting edge research. So uh, new, you know, new physics go in, new, new uh, computational methods go into these codes first and are tested out and demonstrated and typically uh, papers are written. Uh, these codes are available. So, um, you know, then what a lot of times what happens is the, the, the cutting edge stuff that goes in and is demonstrated in these academic codes make their way into the other codes. And in fact, in a lot of the, the industrial affiliate programs that we have here at UT, uh, these guys like CMG and Eclipse, they're members of them. So they actually pay money to these affiliate programs, which, so you get multiple companies that pay like say 50K a year, and those support a collection of graduate students to do research. In fact, in these codes, and then when something interesting or uh, you know, something useful develops from these guys, they make their way into those codes. Um, these guys are, are typically not as user friendly as those, right? So these codes don't have those all the pretty GUIs and buttons you click, and you know a lot of the interaction with these codes would just be through text files and and submitting jobs on supercomputers and other things. Um, so yeah, we didn't uh, really talk about. Gas in this, you know, when we talk about single phase flow, we didn't talk about gas, but it's basically the same idea. We just write down the mass balance or the continuity equation, but now you have a compressible fluid, so the density is a function of pressure. So ultimately, your your diffusivity equation uh, is nonlinear, and um, you know because you you have a your your density is a function of pressure, right? Uh, so uh, there's, there's a couple of ways you can solve this. I think you guys probably in res 2, you do this pseudo pressure thing, right? You know, I, I don't, I'm a computational guy, so I like, well, just if you have the right equation, just solve the right equation. So th this is sort of the way I would do it, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, the, the uh, you, can, you can just solve the nonlinear PD directly. So, so the pseudo equation, yeah, I mean, the pseudo pressure, you, you sort of group terms to give you something that looks like pressure, and then you recover another linear 
diffusivity equation, which you solve for the pseudo pressure, right? But but this is you know the, the real diffusivity equation. Now, if you if you work through all the details, the details are missing. But if you work through the details, you get a system of equations that looks identical to what we derive in this class. It's just now your matrices are functions of pressure. So the nonlinearity is very clear in that you know if you have the B matrix, which is a function of pressure, and you're multiplying it by pressure, so you're going to have like sort of like pressure squared there, right? And so this is not you can't just invert the matrix. And so typically the way these are solved is that. Uh, you, you know, you move everything to the right-hand side, and you can d define this as just a function equal to zero, right? It's a function of pressure, and what you want to do is essentially, if you can guess the right pressure, guess, right? If you can guess the right pressure, then all these terms cancel, and you get zero, right? Well, of course, we don't just you don't just guess, right? You you start with a guess maybe, but then you <coughs> put it into an optimization routine. Or you probably learned in your numerical methods class, remember Newton's method or newton raphson method? Right? You probably did that for a one-dimensional one, uh, problem. But there's, there's also an equivalent in 3D, or I mean not in 3D, in multi-dimensions, newton raphson method, where you, you create this sort of Jacobian matrix, and then you run it through the nonlinear iter iteration. So essentially, uh, this is how you'd solve those, e those equations for gas flow. Um, you know, in this class, for the most part, we ignored capillary pressure and gravity, uh, but it's not really a big deal to include them. You know, you know how to include them, certainly for Darcy Law. You just add the, the rho GH term in the, in, the, uh, in the potential, and then the capillary pressure, you just have the, the capillary pressure is that we, when we did any like Buckley Leverett and all that, we just said the capillary pressure is zero, right? But the real capillary pressure. Of course, is the difference between the oil and water pressure, and you need a constitutive model or a curve that relates it to. Um, and so, you can actually mathematically you can lump them together uh, on the right hand side of the equations. And if you define this so G, that's you know this is your normal transmissibility. This is a vector Z, right, which is the height now of all the grid grid cells, right. So it's a vector. For all the grid blocks, L, you know, L total number of grid blocks times the transmissibility times rho h um, times the transmissibility times the vector of the capillary pressures at each of the grid blocks. So of course, when we go to 3D, we absolutely have to have gravity right, uh, if you want an accurate simulation. Uh, but other than that, they're no different except the matrix equations are identical to what they are, except now they're heptadiagonal. And of course, on your midterm exam, you had a question, right? So now you, how many non-zero entries in one row for the transmissibility matrix are? Yeah. So hepta. And of course, gravity is included. So then ultimately, you'd have these equations that are identical to what they were, and then you have this gravity term over here on the right right hand side. That that was defined in the previous slide. Um, so for near well simulations, we'll often use radial geometry. So this is no different. Uh, I mean, it's the same. You, you know what the radial diffusivity equation is, right? You know what the radial diffusivity equation is, and you know how to do finite differences, right? It's just now, instead of a spatial like delta x, you're going to difference on delta r. And you can develop the radial uh, finite difference equations. And guess what? Ultimately, they have the exact same form. No big deal. So you'd use this in the near whale board regions where you need very accurate uh, distributions, pressures. So fractures, her, uh, horizontal wells. You know, we, we did some horizontal wells in CMG, or at least you got to do one uh, horizontal well. Uh, when you have you know, hydraulic fractures, which is, you know, sort of, at this point, it's the future of oil and gas, right? I mean, it's almost nothing that's, that's uh, the future's in unconventional, so you're probably going to be used to this. And the, the problem with, with fractures are is that they're, they're highly conductive to hydrocarbons, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, much, much more so than the way 
fluid moves through a shell, particularly, right? I mean, based on impermeable media. So they're highly conductive, uh, but they're very, very th small compared to the reservoir. So this causes sort of a numerical difficulty because in order to resolve, and, and also, you know, particularly in shells, you have very, very steep pressure gradients. So, you know, right near the, just in a few inches of the fracture, you know, the pressure goes from, from whatever the production, you know, whatever the bottom hole pressure is, essentially, to, to almost nothing, right, in, you know, in the reservoir. Very, very steep. And if you want to capture that gradient, right, if you want to capture that steep gradient, you need a lot of grid blocks, right? You need a lot of grid blocks because, remember, the pressure is constant in a grid block. And so if you have... this is the radial distance away from a fracture or well bore, and this is pressure, and you have, a, you have a very steep gradient like that, and all you have, you know, say you had one grid block there, well, what's the best you can do? Something like that, right? That's not a very good approximation of that curve. Right? If you had, so say, say you had two, right? Maybe you have something like this. That's not a very good approximation of that curve, right? In order to have a good approximation, you need Many, many. Which means to you know to resolve this, you need to resolve this pressure gradient over a few inches near a fracture in a reservoir that's five kilometers by five kilometers. Probably not going to get it done with the computers that exist today. Right? So you have to do something else, and and the, the sort of standard technique, not that it's really great, uh, particularly in unconventionals is the so-called dual porosity, dual permeability models. And if you remember right when you open up CMG's builder, first thing it asks you, right, is do you want to use dual porosity, dual permeability? So these are, these are uh, quite ubiquitous, and there's a little more about those in a second. And then, of course, like we said, um, you know, vertical wells are just in one block, horizontal wells you distribute over many blocks, and you've seen that, okay? Um, History matching, you also, also got to see. So the idea there is that, you know, if we can't predict the past, then how do we expect to predict the future? But there's so much uncertainty in the inputs, and there's a lot of inputs, right, uh, in one of these reservoir simulators. So we use the history matching, or essentially a nonlinear regression analysis, to adjust the inputs a little bit so that we can match the, hit, the, the past. Now. Just because you match the past it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to accurately predict the future, unfortunately. But it's, it's very hard at all to, to make any claim about the future if you can't predict the past, right? If you can't predict what, what's already happened, what you know, you know, essentially the data. If you can't reproduce the experimental data, the experiment being the production history, right? Uh, so, yeah, we have, you know, the input parameters, um, just more of the things. So, um, you know, in one respect, you can do some manual tuning and an experienced reservoir simulation, reservoir engineer would be able to do that. In other words, before, before he sent it to, because you remember, to get very good matches in CMOS, it takes a long time, right? Uh, and, but, you know, a very experienced um, reservoir engineer might know exactly where to go, make a few adjustments first, and get a much better match, you know, sort of manually before he turns it over to the optimization routine, right? And so, you know, when, when you run CMOS, that, you know, essentially it's just a, a set of nonlinear optimization routines, constrained optimization routines. Uh, yeah, so these are some of the parameters that are typical to vary, you know. I'd say probably the most, you know, just like we, in what, in the, Assignment: you, you varied the header, the anisotropy of the permeability field, and what else? Compressibility. Yeah, I mean those are two very common. Also, uh, capillary pressure uh, is one that that's also used a lot. Can can uh, in multi-phase flow you can go a long way with the capillary pressure adjustments to the capillary pressure. Uh, so yeah, I mean. You know, 
Has anyone had a course in optimization or sort of understand how optimization works? Right? In optimization, you essentially have some objective function, some mathematical function that you're trying to minimize or maximize, right? So, or, yeah, or find a saddle point, find some stationary value of a function. And so, you know, so what you do is you say, you know, the, pr the, pr the pressure that is, the simulator's predicting, you compare that to actual bottom hole pressure data. And usually what's done is you just, you try to minimize the, the sum of the square of the errors. So you basically have the, you have some, you know, some objective function that, you know, you have your real pressure at, at you know, bottom hole pressure. Your, you know, I don't want to say experiment or real minus uh, simulation, right? And then you square that guy, take the square root. And if you had multiple wells that you can compare it to, then, you know, this would be, say, well one, and then you'd add, add in uh, experiment for well two. So, so the, 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 this would just give you a scalar value, right? Then ultimately you want to drive that to zero, right? Because if, if this is zero, then these are mashed perfectly, right? So, you know, and you could do that, you know, the more wells you have, then you just continue like that. Um, other things you can, you can match. And so you can set up fairly complex optimization schemes and of course, the more things you're trying to hit, the more things you're trying to match, then the uh, the longer the thing is going to take to run. Really, uh, you can also wait. You know, you say, well, I know I'm never going to match everything perfectly, so you can you can wait and say, well, I, you know, I want to match the bottom hole pressure the best. So you can set up an optimization scheme that weights that better than the others. Uh, same same with you can wait. The parameters you're going to vary, and I think you you did that in your in your exercise, right? So you basically said, well, you know, I, I have the most confidence that the compressibility is near my input value, so please don't change it too much, right? But but the anisotropy I have no clue about, so feel free to change it. In words, this is what you're mathematically telling the optimization routine to do. Uh, so, th you know, this sort of returning to the fracture modeling, you know, in a, this, this is not necessarily even with respect to hydraulic fracture, but in any reservoir you have just natural fractures in the reservoir, right? And in particular, shales are very highly naturally fractured, and that's sort of why hydraulic fracturing works so well, because we, we connect up those nat natural fracture networks that are already existing. And so, of course, the, the, fra the fractures, much more conductive than the matrix, and so you need to account for that some way. And, and, and one of the ways, or the classical way to do it, would be this dual porosity model. And if you have a fairly distributed network of fractures, sort of like the picture up there, well, that's strange. So if you have a fairly distributed network of fractures, like in the picture up there, then these dual porosity models can work pretty well. Because essentially, what you're doing is you have a matrix, and then sort of, sort of in between uh, the matrix blocks, you have highly conductive channels, if you will, uh, of higher, you know, layers of higher permeability, and then there's some transfer functions between the matrix and the, the high permeability ch channels, and you sort of idealize that scenario like that. And for, if you have a well-connected, homogeneously distributed network of fractures, these models work fairly well. They don't, in fact, work well for you know, if, you, if they're not well connected, or in the case of like a hydraulic fracture where it's sort of a, you know, a discrete network of very, you know, not very large fractures, yeah, they may connect up a lot of sm smaller natural fractures in which a model like this would work, but, you know, you have very large, fairly, fairly straight, if you will, uh, hydraulic fractures you're producing. So in those types of scenarios, uh, the new, you know, I don't know if I, the new approach, but you know, in those types of scenarios, a discrete fracture model like this would be would be better. So in that case, you'd have to go to some sort of higher order, better method than your your. So you notice these cells are not perfectly square, right? 
So those, everything we've done so far with finite differences, you had a perfectly regular grid, okay? Perfectly rectangular lattice, if you will. Now here you have, you don't have, so in order to, to perfectly conform your, your mesh, that's what this thing is called, your mesh to the fractures, it's very hard to do with, uh, if you, you know, if you know your exact fracture geometry, then you can't really do that with square grid blocks. You're not going to do a very good job. It's impossible to match this irregular geometry with square grids perfectly, right? So, uh, so you have to mesh it, and then in this particular case, I happen to know that that uh, because of this picture came from Dr. Seth Nori, that this is essentially a finite volume method. There's also so-called finite element methods. Uh, in a finite volume method, I actually, I do finite elements, basically, is an area of my research. But in a finite volume method, it's really uh, not much different than what we did in the so-called control volume approach, right? You have a flux coming in from each side, and you just account, just do a sort of an accounting of all the fluxes, right? That's, that's essentially what you're doing in a finite volume method. It's just now you have arbitrarily shaped sides, and in this case, they're all quadrilaterals, but in fact, the method is general enough to handle complete like n polygons. So these cells could be just completely arbitrarily shaped, and then you just do an accounting of the fluxes coming in from all the sides. The problem is, or the difficulty, is that those fluxes have derivatives in them, right? And it's easy to approximate a derivative on a perfect lattice, right? It just you know, it's a, it's a finite difference, right? You just, the, the change in quantity from here to there divided by the distance from here to there. Right? But it's a little bit more difficult because the flux vectors are normal to these surfaces, but the quantities live at the cell centers. So if you draw a straight line from cell center to cell center, it's not perfectly normal to any vector on any arbitrary face. And so there's a little bit of... <coughs> numerics you have to do that makes it a little bit more difficult. But, um, you know, so this, these are more advanced uh, simulators and based on finite elements or finite volume method. So does anybody, I mean, just while we're on the topic, so if a finite volume can have arbitrarily shapes, really the, the main difference between finite differences that we've been doing in finite volumes is the shape of the cell, right? Here we're limited to squares and, and, and you know, blocks. Over here, we're, we can have arbitrarily in polygon shape. But in both cases, let's say, for example, in single phase flow, you're just computing one pressure. The pressure uh, is on the whole grid block. Right? The pressure, even in this case for a finite volume, even though the, the shell can be arbitrarily shaped, you're just computing one pressure for the entire volume. Okay, So then, what do you think of finite element? What's the difference in a finite element and a finite volume? You know? Obey, you should know. Right? You're giving the rest of the class an opportunity? Okay. So in a finite volume, we have one pressure. Right? In a finite element, we actually assume a distribution, or in fact, an interpolation across the element. And we can assume whatever we want. Right? So we can assume it to be constant. In that case, you just have finite volumes. So in fact, finite volumes are special cases of finite elements. But more often than that, we, we often use, assume like linear distribution. Right? Or, but we could go quadratic or higher. Or, you know, uh, typically, we assume some polynomial interpolation or distribution across the function, but uh, across the cell. But we can use other interpolation methods as well. So now, in one cell, you don't just have one value. You have a function. And so you can actually compute, you can compute the pressure here, and it would be different than the pressure over there within one cell, because you have a function for the pressure in the cell. And so with that, we get higher order convergence rates, which basically means we can, we can approach the exact solution faster than, than with, you can with finite elements and finite volumes. Because, you know, it's sort of like this. If I knew the pressure distribution was, say, you know, that kind of looks like a quadratic, right? So if I know the pressure distribution is a quadratic, I can assume an interpolation of quadratic. And in basically one element, I can match that very well. 
And I wouldn't need 100 like you'd need in final differences. Uh, upscaling, so this is an area of research uh, where, of course, you know, so th there's sort of two ways, kind of computational upscaling and, and also experimental. So, you know, we go to the lab and we have little tiny cores that are fairly homogeneous compared to the real reservoir, right? They're certainly not large faults or fractures in our cores, right? They wouldn't even hold together. Maybe small ones, right? But, but for the most part, you know, it's impossible to core a large fault or large fracture, you know, your core size would also be too big for the laboratory. So, you know, we go to the laboratory and we measure permeability, porosity, and other things, and then we try to put those into our simulator and scale it up and it doesn't always work. That's why I have to use history matching a lot of times because in the real world, there's a lot of heterogeneity, right? A lot, lot more than what we can capture or, or we'd have to take, you know, so many cores that sort of unreasonable. The, the other way we can do upscaling is sort of computationally, right? So um, we, can, uh, we can sort of make synthetic materials in a computer, right? In, in this case, that's like a synthetic uh, pore network up there, right? Or in fact, maybe not synthetic. That, that in fact, probably an image of a real core network that was taken from a CT scan, right? So use a computer to scan pore volumes and then in that guy, you could actually solve the Navier-Stokes equations, right? So, you know, for the most part, we believe the Navier-Stokes equations model fluid transport correctly, right? Better than anything else we can do. Direct numerical simulation of the Navier-Stokes equation. But it's very expensive. And so we couldn't, you know, solve the Navier-Stokes equations on a reservoir, right? But we could solve them on a little core like that, and we can use that, say, to use it to determine computationally what the permeability is, if you will, right? or permeability tensor. And then we can plug that into a larger scale simulation and then ultimately up to the reservoir. Right? So, uh, you know, we always lose information in, a, in a upscaling. And, and upscaling is probably one of the most challenging things in petroleum engineering because very, very often, the, the things we measure in the laboratory, uh, they don't, they don't, you know, our intuition about what happens in the laboratory doesn't scale to the reservoir. We get incorrect answers. Um, so we talked about impasse a lot, or, or you know, spent a, at least a week on it here at the end of the class. Um, you could also do fully implicit. So. This is really no different than what I talked about at the beginning. So in a fully implicit simulation, now we have, uh, except at the beginning we were talking about single phase gas flow, but now you know, we're talking about multi-phase flow. So every single grid block has two unknowns, pressure and saturation, right? which means now instead of, you know, we have this unknown vector x, and it's not just pressures, it's not just saturations, but it, they're interweaved, right? So grid block one, pressure, grid block one, saturation, grid block two, pressure, grid block two, saturation, and so on. And then if you were to construct uh, your, your matrices like that, you wouldn't have perfectly, this is in one dimension, you wouldn't have perfectly tridiagonal, but you'd rather have something called block tridiagonal. So if you notice, all these blocks are the same uh, here, but, the, but the, the, matrix, the, the entire matrix itself, the entire T matrix itself is not tridiagonal. Uh, but but these block components are. So that's what a fully implicit scheme would look like. Um, you know, so for the entire system, you'd get that. The D matrix is also a block tridiagonal. The right-hand side, you know. So again, on the right-hand side, you're going to have pressure, saturation, pressure, saturation, pressure, saturation. We talked about Newton, or I talked about Newton's method a little bit. So again, the way we do this is we put, we put everything on one side of the equation. So we have something equal to zero, and then we have a residual. So it's a function. We call that a residual, but it's just, you can think of it like a function. We have a function of x, and we want that function of x to be, be equal to zero. And so we can construct this tangent matrix, or Jacobian, right, which is basically just a big gradient matrix. It's, it's the, the partials of that residual with respect to every unknown 
So you take the partial of the residual with respect to x1, which x1 would be like the pressure in the first grid block. And you'd, that'd be your first column of this matrix. And then you continue to construct it all. Yeah. And then once you, have the, once you have this constructed, then you just solve this equation, OK, for dx. But that's just an update. In other words, that dx is the change in x from what your initial guess was. And you have to do it again and again and again and again, slowly moving dx towards the real solution. And the real solution would be whatever you know the x is that equ equilibrates that equation, where you'd actually get 0. In reality, you never get there. Right? You never actually make it 0. You have some tolerance. right? So you have some tiny number that you'd want to drive the residual below. And then you'd accept that as your solution. Yeah. So that's what you just update. So you have the original x plus this change that you computed there. And this can be very expensive because now you have, so you have x, you know, so you solve that, you, you construct this guy, it takes a while, and then you solve it and you update x. Well, now your residual is a function of x, so you got to stick that back in there, reconstruct this guy again solve it again, and do it over and over and over. So these, these guys can be pretty intensive calculations. So in a comp, uh, compositional simulation, you know, this is really at the forefront. Uh, uh, Jim in, in uh, CMG, right? So in, in compositional, you're balancing on each hydrocarbon component, right? So you can, you're balancing on methane, propane, butane, or whatever. And uh, so then you solve for the concentration of each species. Um, you can use it um, an impact method, implicit pressure, explicit concentration, or you can solve it fully explicit. And now you have to do flash calculations to determine, you know, which you have every component, uh, propane, but, you know, it can be in also liquid or gas phase. So you have to do the flash calculations. You have to have an equation of state, right? This is all thermo stuff. to be able to solve it, right? So another alternative to uh, impasse or fully implicit for multi-phase flow is so-called streamline simulations. So in streamlines, instead of having grid blocks, in which flow is you know, transferred from grid block to grid block, you, you have basically have a, a, a realization of a bunch of streamlines through the reservoir. And then you solve the equations over those sort of streamlines. Or, tubes, sort of, if you will. And it's done along finite differences, done along finite differences along the, the, the streamlines. They're much faster, um, and, uh, and they're better for convective dominated flow type scenarios. So if you have high velocities in the flow. So advances in computation. If I had to lay, give myself an expertise, right, this, was, this is my expertise. Right? So uh, basically in parallel computing, um, when, when our simulations get long, when they take an hour, right, I can code it up in parallel. And if I have four processors, it'll only take 15 minutes. If I have eight processors, it'll take seven and a half, right? ideally doesn't quite scale perfectly all the time. But if you code it up well, uh, up to some sort of saturation point, in other words, there's always some limitation because in a typical distributed memory parallel scheme, you have a whole room full of computers. And so each of these blades is like one of your laptops, or actually a little stronger. You know, Each of these blades is like one high-powered desktop. Right? And so each of those might have 8 or 16 cores in it. And so we'll take our big problem and we'll break it up and we'll send a chunk to that blade and that blade and that blade and that blade. And each of those solve the problem on their own. But of course, the problem's not independent, right? I mean, you have flux going from one grid block to the next. And so if you break your problem up and, and you know, this room is on one processor and that room is on another processor, I have to communicate. 
I have to send the information over the network. Right? These supercomputers work on a really, really high bandwidth network called InfiniBand. And, and so the, the message passing is done, and it's very, very fast. It's not like, it's like sending over the you know, internet at your office. It's, it's much, much faster than that. But nevertheless, there's some overhead associated with it. So in other words, you know, there, there is a limit to how many times I could split the problem. It, it, I cannot, in fact, like put one grid block per processor. Because you know? like at TAC, uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center, out at uh, Pickle, I mean, to have a computer there that has like 68,000 processors. Right? So theoretically, I could just put one grid block on all processors, and you know that hour turns into a second. But it doesn't work like that because of communication. Right? They have to. There's some communication. So you can get linear scaling up to some point, and then communicate. When communication starts to dominate, then you then you have to kind of stop that. So this is a traditional supercomputing. Um, this is called distributed memory com supercomputing. So distributed memory because each of those, you think of like each of those blades is like a desktop which has its own memory, has its own RAM, right? Okay. The, the other shared memory supercomputing. Now this is what we're starting to do even in your laptop, right? So your laptop has multiple cores and all of those cores share memory with each other. And so you might have heard of things like threading, hyper-threading, multi-threading. This is the idea that, that each of the cores that sh on a shared memory system can do some parallel tasks while accessing the same memory, right? And th then you don't have the message passing deal, right? Because everything, all the information, all your data, all your transmissibility matrices, everything is all stored here. And this is each little processor gets a piece of it to work on. The problem is that even today, this, the size of this memory is limited. So what, in reality, what we have now is a whole bunch of these multi-core machines sitting inside those blades. So we had shared memory computers inside a distributed memory system. And if we write our codes very, very well, we can take advantage of that. This is called hybrid parallelization. But this is at the forefront of high-performance computing to be able to do these kinds of things. Uh, mentioned UT Chem earlier. You know, it's, it's the multi-component, multi-phase composition model that, you know, in particularly, uh, it's very, very good at chemical EOR. We have some of the world's foremost experts in chemical EOR here, um, but there's just some details about UT Chem, which you can download, and companies do. IPARS, this is Mary Wheeler's uh, group, her code. Um, now, this is sort of interesting in that, um, you know, and this code is set up in a way that you can do sort of multiple physics in different domains. So you could have, say, a black oil model here and a compositional model here, a single phase model there, thermal, chemistry, and then you can sort of glue them together and the, 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 with some numerics. Right? So the numerical trick there, um, you know, also it, you can do, say, the, the multi-numeric. So you can have a part of the reservoir where you need very, very high accuracy. And in that area, you can do fully implicit model methods. And then outside to that, where you know you don't the accuracies, or in particularly if you had high gradients and you had stability issues, you could do fully implicit, and outside of that you could do impest. Because remember, I guess I should have mentioned that earlier, a fully implicit method is unconditionally stable. Right? We can take as large a time steps as we want without, you know, a danger of, of stability. That's almost true. For linear problems, it's true. For nonlinear problems, it's almost true. Uh, so if you had some stability issues, you could solve fully implicit, which is more expensive here, and you could solve impasse everywhere else, and then through numerics, you can sort of glue them together. So that makes them for some efficient code. Um, so yeah, so just in summary, you know where we are, this is kind of today. We typically solve problems with millions of unknowns in reservoir simulators. Um, you know, while I wouldn't say any really commercial reservoir simulators are finite elements based, um, you know, there's certainly some in academia, and, and you know, even myself, we're working on some uh, reservoir simulators based on the finite element method, FEM. Um, parallel processing uh, applications, 
uh, carbon sequestration. I didn't really talk, you know, I mentioned there was a Tough 2, which is developed at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's a finite different space or um, reservoir simulator, but its main focus is on res in carbon se sequestration. Okay. Um, so, you know, we've made some improvements recently through the discrete fracture network models and the modeling of natural fractures, nonlinear flow compositional models. So this is sort of the state of the art today, uh, and, and this is kind of where we're going with reservoir simulation. So, you know, billions of unknowns. This will be through hybrid parallelization and other things. Uh, bigger, faster computers. We're going to get that from our friends. Uh, but really, this, this right here, unconventional resident resources and more carbon sequestration stuff. So with unconventionals, you know, particularly shale, it's, it's quite different in the, in the physics that dominate. And, and in fact, um, very, very localized phenomena can d dominate the production of the entire reservoir. So things that are happening just within a few inches of the well bore, a few inches of the fracture, can dominate the physics of draining the entire reservoir. And so you need really highly resolved models with lots of physics in them in those regions, right? And so the idea would then be how to upscale it or how to couple that to understand how we're going to drain an entire reservoir, okay? Uh, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of geomechanics, too, you know? So the, the geomechanics capabilities in most commercial simulators and CMG and other things are quite rudimentary. So when we say geomechanics, now we're actually coupling the deformation of the reservoir with the fluid flow, right? And so, of course, the deformation of the reservoir changes the pore pressure. That affects how the fluid flow is going to, and vice versa, right? The fluid dissolution or diffusion through the rock can also affect the stress, which can affect the strength and other things. And then you couple that in with fractures and other things. And geomechanics is very important. So geomechanics is very, very important in shales, in heavy oil, and unconventional future. And that's it. So with that, I think, uh, Abe, did you get the, I think we'll uh, do the course evaluations and yeah. Uh, you can just review these slides. Uh, they're, they're on the website under, you know, advanced to or special topics. But just understand that in a, in a fully implicit model, those matrices are functions of the unknown, right? And so, well, for multiphase flow, they're functions of the unknown. And because of that, they're nonlinear equations. And because they're nonlinear equations, you can't just use a linear solver. You can't just invert a matrix. You have to use some nonlinear Newton-Raphson iteration. So that, something like that.